people that try to do bodily harm with me, they will be in the house with Puff. You're not paying me and you're not respecting me. And that's the real problem. When people see me, they just see me agitated, but they don't know why. It's a funny game y'all playing behind the scenes. The long-standing conflicts between Diddy and Mace have become widely recognized. Mace has consistently spoken out against what he perceives as wrongful actions by Diddy. In a recent set of allegations, Mace once again addresses Diddy, alleging Diddy's purported unsettling fixation with Biggie. Diddy has been making headlines consistently in recent weeks, with reports surfacing about various scandalous wrongdoings in both his business and personal dealings. Amidst the tale of misfortune surrounding many of Diddy's well-known associates, Mace stands out as one of the most intriguing figures in the rap mogul sphere. Although Mace successfully extricated himself from his tumultuous stint at Bad Boy Records, the prolific artist has sustained a lengthy and heated feud with Diddy, primarily rooted in financial and business disputes. I have to release him for any claims or wrongdoings or actions prior to the date of the release. In 1999, Mace took a hiatus from his music career to embark on a new journey as a minister. His decision was influenced by a series of unfortunate events that unfolded during his tenure at the Bad Boy label. The tragic and premature death of label mate The Notorious B.I.G. in 97 played a significant role in prompting the Can't Nobody Hold Me Down rapper to turn to spirituality. Additionally, during that period, the Bad Boy label grappled with a range of legal challenges, resulting in the imprisonment of several artists. Notably, Shine faced a conviction for armed A in connection to a 99 shooting incident. In point of fact, it is said that when Mace was at the pinnacle of his career as a result of the success of his album Harlem World, he disclosed this information to a radio interviewer. Quote, I felt like I had a lot of money, but I didn't really know who I was. I knew I had to do something other than just hip hop. But there are others who are unsure as to why Mace left. Diddy does not allow someone to easily claim a position as a bad boy insider and get out of their contract. He had Mace signed to a deal for a significant amount of time. Me quitting after one album, it didn't take long for me to figure it out. Like, I'm not going to be here with this. You're not paying me and you're not respecting me. But Mace still managed to come back after five years without getting any royalties. Mace made two notable comebacks from his retirement. The first occurred in 2004 with the release of an album titled Welcome Back, and the second in 2009 when he dropped a non-album single called Get It, and later released Double Up. Unfortunately, his return in 09 faced obstacles due to label issues, leading to a dramatic moment during Diddy's live radio interviewer with V103's Ryan Cameron. However, he then expressed a desire to leave once more and even managed to sneak his way into an interview with Puffy, during which he requested that he be released from the contract. Then in 2016, he made his return during a Bad Boy Records tour and immediately began criticizing his ex-boss. After that, he went live on Instagram to explain the circumstances around the incident. When I see the hurt and the pains of other people on bad boy that motivates me to say something so I don't be deemed as a person who just made a bunch of money and turned a blind eye. Despite a seemingly heartfelt speech at the Grammys, tensions between Mace and Diddy persisted, with Mace resuming his criticism of the mogul. Diddy said, quote, Truth be told, hip-hop has never been respected by the Grammys. Black music has never been respected by the Grammys to the point that it should be. While many musicians resonated with Diddy's words, Maze did not share the sentiment. In a now-deleted Instagram post, the rapper voiced his dissatisfaction, expressing grievances about what he perceived as unjust treatment from the label head at Bad Boy. Quote, Your past business practices knowingly has continued purposely starved your artist and been extremely unfair to the very same artist that helped you obtain that icon award. On the iconic Bad Boy label. Not only this, he even disclosed during an interview that he never got paid even if he was the only one behind all the bad boys hit songs. The, the records, the beats, you ain't getting the money, you publishing. ain't getting the publishing, you ain't getting the respect. And I don't think you're like that. His most direct reference to Diddy comes when he mentions the star's latest name change, Brother Love. Quote, since Kane Kate Abel, I'm able to K Kane. Love don't steal, my guy, change your name, Mace raps. And people started to speculate that this rap was directed toward Diddy's K'ing Biggie for financial gain. 
The close relationship between Diddy and Biggie is a well-known fact, but recent revelations suggest that their connection may have been more business-oriented, particularly from Diddy's perspective. Netflix's documentary on Biggie has shed light on aspects of the rapper's life beyond his death, prompting fans to reconsider the nature of his association with Diddy. Numerous fans now speculate that Diddy might have taken advantage of Biggie and exploited his career. The documentary not only provides insights into Biggie's life, but also emphasizes that he was more than just a casualty of hip-hop feuds. Within the bad boy music era, individuals apart from Diddy such as Gene Deal, a former bodyguard closely associated with Diddy, offered their own accounts of behind-the-scenes conversations and events. According to Diddy, Biggie had plans to part ways with Bad Boy Records in search of a more favorable deal elsewhere. Why are you going to tell the man who make all the money for us? That's a setup. They were setting that boy up, man. Do you understand what I'm saying? Allegedly, Diddy had a significant financial stake in Biggie's success, making it a considerable challenge if the rapper decided to part ways with Bad Boy Records. While the tragic narrative surrounding Biggie's unsolved M and the events leading up to it is widely known, fans have sought to understand whether Diddy played a role in the rapper's demise. Biggie, a Brooklyn-born MC, lost his life in Los Angeles shortly before the scheduled release of his album Life After Death. And I seen Big Contract, and it was talking about, well, you get 250000 you know, uh, for signing, you're going to get another 250000 of Dingo Gold. Gene Deal, a former bodyguard closely associated with Diddy, recently shared insights on DJ Vlad's vlog, suggesting that Biggie had diverse plans before his untimely death, with a new record deal being one of them. According to Deal, he had a chance to see Biggie's bad boy contract when entrusted with watching over Diddy's briefcase during a flight. The contract detailed Biggie's earnings in increments of $250,000 with publishing income remaining under Puff's control. In Deal's account, he questioned Biggie about this arrangement, and the rapper allegedly disclosed his intentions to leave bad boy for a lucrative deal surpassing $60 million. This revelation implies that Biggie was actively pursuing opportunities beyond his existing contract and sheds light on the financial dynamics between the rapper and Diddy during that period. Quote, he showed me. It had Charlie Baltimore, Cameron, Lil C's, Lil Kim, Junior Mafia, Tracy Lee, and The Commission, he explained. I think the contract was for so many years for like $62 million. It comes out to $62 million. Deal asserted that Big wanted to stop Junior Mafia's way of doing business and have them start writing and holding their own. In addition to planning his departure from Bad Boy Records, Biggie reportedly intended to bring Lil Kim and Gene deal with him to the next label. However, he believed that Deal's loyalty to Puffy might pose a hindrance to such a move. Big was like, yo, Gene, I like you. I would take you with me, bruh, but you love too much. I said, love that too much? What do you mean I love it too much? It's worth noting that Gene Deal has been sharing his insights on a YouTube vlog, offering a collection of stories related to iconic figures such as Biggie, Tupac, Diddy, Black Rob, and others associated with Bad Boy in the 90s and early 2000s. Deal has been vocal about his disagreements with Diddy and has raised questions about the events that transpired within the Bad Boy label. Deal's revelations include discussions about Jennifer Lopez's relationship with Diddy, insights into Suge Knight, and his perspectives on the mystery surrounding Biggie. Biggie's death. Having been part of Diddy's security team, Deal was an eyewitness to Biggie's M in 97 and experienced the notorious East vs. West hip-hop rivalry. His close collaboration with Diddy for years suggests an intimate knowledge of the mogul's actions and decisions. Muslims shot Big, and I said to Paul, with the blue suit, white shirt, blue bow tie, he said, Gene, how you know? I said, that walked up to Puff car first. While Deal seems confident in his claims, verifying the details, especially those related to Biggie's contract, can be challenging. With Biggie no longer present to confirm or deny these accounts, the truth remains somewhat elusive. However, Biggie's mother, Valletta Wallace, discussed her son's financial arrangements with Bad Boy Records in her 2005 book, Biggie, Valletta Wallace Remembers Her Son Christopher, providing some additional context to the financial aspects of his career. Quote, the truth is, Christopher accepted the illusion of a friend and mentor for about $25,000. That's the amount Puffy lured my son with. That was a lot of money for Christopher back then as a 19-year-old. He had never seen that much at one time in his life. It was enough money to make my son believe that Puffy was ready to do anything for him. It was enough to buy a blind love and loyalty. Diddy kept taking advantage of Biggie's innocence and according to people, because of his greed, he made Biggie his label's main rapper. It came to light by himself. 
In the designated last train to Paris appreciation room on the social media platform, Diddy shared anecdotes about his journey, sources of inspiration, and his enduring friendship with the iconic figure, the notorious B.I.G. Among the stories, Diddy disclosed that before achieving legendary status as a rapper, Biggie had expressed a desire to serve as his manager. Quote, It was really Biggie's idea for me to start rapping, the Bad Boy Records founder explained. It wasn't like I was a cat who was banging on the lunch table. It was more like I followed in the footsteps of the star producers like Dr. Dre and like Teddy Riley. I was teaching Biggie the game and he was like, yo, I want to manage you, I'ma write your rhymes. And I was open to it, Diddy continued. Under Biggie's management, the pair released It's All About the Benjamins and Can't Nobody Hold Me Down, which featured Mace. Both tracks landed on Diddy's studio debut, No Way Out. We did them at the same time, released them at the same time, Diddy said of the songs, so that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Diddy also reflected on the moment he realized the power of hip-hop and setting trends, which for him, was seeing thousands of people bum-rush the stage during a run DMC show. Quote, you have that first tier, that's the floor. Then you have that second tier. I was in that second tier to the left, like 12 rows back, he began. I was sitting there, and Run had held up his Adidas and said, everybody hold up your Adidas. And I saw 30,000, 35,000 extra cats just bum rush the door. Like the barrier was on a tilt. And when I looked up there, I was like, I don't know what that is, but I want to do that. That was like the tipping point, he continued, that triggered me as far as understanding the power of us and making brands. I was like, I want to do that up there, but I also want to do everything. Harnessing the force of manifestation, Diddy eventually achieved the feat of selling out his own show at the very venue where he once occupied a seat as an observer. Reflecting on the experience, he recounted being elevated for the performance and gazing down at the very seat he once occupied. Quote, I saw that seat that I had been sitting in and I came down to victory. It's all about manifestation and belief every day presents a new opportunity, he emphasized. So many people have concluded that he wanted more money. He knew that Biggie would make him bucks of dollars overnight and it would only help him financially. In an interview, DMX also shares his fond memories of Biggie and explains how Biggie helped him appreciate a smile. I never saw Biggie smile until after he died. It was in the hypnotized video, said DMX. When I saw it, I was like, wow, he was really enjoying his life and it got taken away from him. It was then that I cherished a smile. But people have been suggesting that there was something wrong between Diddy and Biggie from the very beginning. DMX suggesting that he never smiled is quite concerning for the fans. And people speculate that he are'd Biggie. That is why he got depressed. Even during the time of his death, he was not alone. Eugene Jean Deal, former bodyguard of Diddy, has asserted that the notorious B.I.G. was not a victim of a drive-by shooting. According to Deal, Biggie's assailant was patiently waiting for him throughout the night. The iconic rapper, famous for Juicy, met his tragic end on March 9, 97, in Los Angeles, California at the age of 24. According to FBI documents, Christopher Wallace, known as the Notorious B.I.G., was a passenger in a Chevrolet Suburban, leaving a party at the Peterson Automotive Museum. At a red light, a Chevy SS Impala pulled alongside, and a gunman from within opened fire. Wallace succumbed to the gunshot wounds less than an hour later at a local hospital. His autopsy, disclosed to the public in 2012, indicated that he was shot four times. The M remains unsolved to this day. In a video published by YouTube channel The Art of Dialogue on Tuesday, Deal, who said he was traveling in a second Chevrolet Suburban with Diddy, real name Sean Combs, behind Biggie on the night of the shooting, gave his own account of what happened. Quote, wasn't no drive-by. The car was standing there at the corner, he said. The stories they tell is not truthful, and now people are sitting here believing. Deal added, every Biggie movie that you see, they say it's a drive-by. When the witness tells you the car was stood right there at the corner, the car was probably there all night. Eugene Jean Deal in a prior statement expressed his belief that the notorious B.I.G. was not the intended target on the night of his tragic death. In an interview with Vlad TV last year, Deal disclosed that he had received information earlier that day suggesting that individuals were targeting Puff Daddy at the time with the intent to K him. I said to him, Puff, I've got some intel. The guys are coming to chaos tonight at the museum party, Deal recalled. In an FBI investigation file obtained by The Sun in 2018, Deal made the same claim. Quote, Deal noticed an unknown black male, UM, wearing a blue suit, white shirt, blue tie, receding hairline with hair cropped close, approach where Combs' car had just arrived, said the document, according to The Sun. While Combs and others took pictures and mingled with the crowd, Deal intercepted the UM as he tried to approach Combs' car. Deal pulled his G out of his waistband and showed it to the UM as to be telling him to back away. 
Once this UM saw Deal's G, he walked away from Combs' car, heading eastbound on Fairfax Boulevard and got into a car that was parked on the corner exactly where Biggie was shot and, according to Deal, was most likely the car that committed the shooting. According to The Sun, the document said that after intercepting the UM, Deal then got into a car with Combs and told the driver to run the next red light, which is a standard security procedure to ensure the passengers don't become sitting targets. Combs' car ran the red light, but Wallace's car stopped. Quote, the shooter hesitated for quite a while before shooting into Biggie's car, the document said according to The Sun. Because of this, Deal strongly believes Biggie was not the intended target but that Combs was. After this revelation, people started speculating that Diddy sacrificed Biggie to protect his own self. One person wrote, quote, Diddy sacrificed Biggie and Tupac. Another one added, quote, This is going to sound crazy, but there would be no Biggie without Puff. Everyone wants to believe Puff was this snake, but he was a teen prodigy who had vision for everyone but himself. R.I.P. Biggie Smalls, the illest. Puff was a Howard University student with vision. He was a native New Yorker with dreams. And New Yorkers rock on a different level than most. If you watch those videos on the subways, people just being cruel to one another makes sense. However, Diddy also did the same thing with Mace too. In a surprise move, Mace barged into the interview armed with documents asserting that he was released from his label obligations, effectively becoming a free agent. According to Mace, Diddy had signed these documents permitting him to collaborate as a featured artist on other rappers' songs. However, it was later revealed that Bad Boy Records retained the publishing rights to all of Mace's music, maintaining control over the minister's rap career. Since their initial conflicts, Diddy and Mace have publicly exchanged jazz. In 2020, Mace expressed his grievances on Instagram, revealing that Diddy declined to sell back his publishing rights. Mace went as far as stating that he offered over $2 million to acquire the entire catalog. The rapper turned minister channeled his frustration into music, releasing a track in 2022 titled Oracle 2, The Liberation of Mace and Betha. This song served as a platform for Mace to further articulate his sentiments and air out his grievances against Diddy. In the track, Mace raps, quote, yeah, I'm just a Harlem guy repping down a Vegas strip with my own Shug. You're from Mount Vernon, go and rep your own hood. You ain't no architect, you just a guy who knows how to market death. Diddy reacted to the track by branding Mace a fake pastor. He also asserted that Mace still owed the label a $3 million album advance for a project that he never delivered. Seems like he always just talks about money.